This week's episode is sponsored by the Rewire team. One day Rewire specialists. Find them on Facebook or Instagram. Just type in the Rewire team and give them a follow. Thanks. Hello everybody and welcome to the Billy Moore podcast and today's special guest is Mandy Jameson. Well, Mandy Jameson, welcome and thank you for coming on. You're welcome. Mandy, uh, Mandy you suffered a, an horrific ordeal by losing your son to a murder. Yeah. Can you, can you tell us what happened and the events that led up to it and a little bit about Daniel? Yeah. Um, it started when Daniel was 12 and um, they stole his bike. They, there was a big group of boys that lived in our area and they sell weed. So because Daniel wouldn't, um, they stole his bike. I, I got money back you know, off one of the parents and the kid didn't like it. So they set fire to his hair and they tried to stab him in a bus stop. So it kind of like went worse from there so every time we get off a bus they jump him or it was sort of it was just getting out of hand it was affecting his mental health they wouldn't fight him one-on-one they'd only fight him in like a pack Hmm. um to be honest with you so was he coming home was he feeling it was he like was his was his uh, was his mental health he was poor. Really poor. You c- I could see it by his appearance because normally he was neurotic over how he looked and he's got to have the best of everything and everything else. And he was only 12. This when it first started. Um, when he's between 15 and 16, that's when the decline went in his personal appearance and how he looked and everything else that went with it. And it was getting harder and harder to deal with. Um, he had ADHD and Asperger's and he was deaf in his left ear as well, profoundly deaf. So as well as dealing with that, he had to put up with that from them lads. Yeah, before we go any further, right, let's not mention uh, the lad who who got arrested. Okay. Okay, we'll just say the name. We'll just say, you know, because it's just for the the fact that the age and stuff at the moment um, and the benefit their family, you know. However, right, tell us a little bit about why that happened and when it happened. Okay. So when Daniel was 16, anyway, um, from the 16th birthday, which was from the August, um, I sent him up to his dad because it was getting too much. Uh, it was affecting his sisters. It was affecting me. The way that they were treating him, the overflow was coming into my house, you see. Um, normally, I can deal with it, but Daniel was a big lad and it was getting too much for me in the end. So I took, sent him up to his dad to keep him safe more than anything. They were still having a go at him. So a straightener was arranged and it was supposed to be with the ringleader. Was he alone? At, was he alone at Daniel? No, he had t- his two friends. He, he yeah. had like... Sh- but he wasn't in a gang? No. No. Um, Alex and Bren, they're his best mates. They were with him all the time. And... Daniel wasn't an angel. I'm not going to sit in and say, you know, my son was an angel. He wasn't. He was arrested carrying a knife just before he died. Um, but what he took it on the chin, as I say. He never made no excuses for what he'd done. When he was asked why he carried the knife, he said, I just want to go and see me mum. Because every time he, he'd come to see me, they would jump him. And so do you think, right, because there's a lot of, like, you know, you're involved in knife mm-hmm. crime heavily now, which is good. Uh, and it's, it's for the grace of the community, the stuff that you do. Do you think young kids now these days who carry knives, most of it's out of fear? Yeah. Okay. Especially, I mean, I understand them boys, that there was 27 of them that I know of anyway, and they'd go out selling the weed, so obviously they felt threatened, that's why they carried it, but that still doesn't justify it. So they feel it was like a deterrent? Yeah. Yeah. Um, as I say, I didn't condone what Daniel done either. Um, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. Whatever excuse it is, Only to me, only a coward carries a knife. Mm. And again, Daniel took it on the chin. He got a sentence for what he'd done. He'd done community service, which then led him on to doing his boxing five nights a week. Yeah. 
finally, at last, he was starting to get his head together and he knew, he knew what he wanted to do, but they just wouldn't leave him alone. So he's, he's had um, he's had a little scare with mm-hmm. the police. So he changed the path he was going yeah. down, got involved in boxing. Yeah. Got his shit together, and then you know he, he was re- it was relentless. Yeah, they were constantly on him all the time. And the main, the ringleader, we'll call him B- Boy A. Yeah, if you like, he has known. I've known the family for years. Um, when he seen how big our Daniel had gone, he got another boy who'd never had to fight in his life. We'll call him Boy B. Yeah. Um, he wasn't a fighter. And I should have showed empathy actually for this kid because he was bullied the same as my son was. But the difference between him and Daniel was is Daniel wouldn't bow. And the only reason why they got away with the bullying is because they did it in a pack. It was never one-on-one. So when Daniel got to the new field that night, um, all the boys that were there in court in and said, we only went to watch Boy B get passes. And they were laughing to us. It was highly amusing. Not... So they weren't even in his corner? No. No. They set him up for a fall. That kid was set up to fall from, mm. de- you know, as soon as this kicked off. I mean, if the main ringleader would have fought his, ba- his own battle, you know, maybe it, the situation would be different now. But the fact is, he couldn't fight. So we got someone else to do it for him, but they set him up for it. And he turned around and said to Boy B, Boy A said to Boy B, if you don't stab Daniel, he said, I want to cut your face and set fire to your house. So, Boy B did as he was told. If you just said that to my son, he'd have laughed in your face and said, go on then, go to look with Mandy. Because I wouldn't, it would have mm. been like dealing with me and I went back, I wouldn't have took it from them either. Yeah. He should have gone and told his dad what they were threatening him with. But I mean, Daniel come and told me so. But that night, I didn't know he'd come down. And Alex's friend said to me, did you go to go to the shop? This was just before the fight started. I went, yeah. yeah. So as I come out, a man on, in Lee Park, I went to turn right. He said, why didn't you turn? I said, if I was meant to turn, I would have. And w- I wasn't <sighs> meant to. Yeah. Cause so he said, well, why was Daniel panicking? He said, if he'd have seen you, and I said, because I'd have dragged him off that field. And I'd probably ended up boxing myself, because you would have been having oh, loads of lads beating me kids up, would you know what I mean? Well, anyway, Daniel won his fight. It ha- it went quite quickly. And um, Boy B pulled this knife out of his pocket and he stabbed him in the groin area right at the top of his leg and it went right through his femoral artery and there was blood vessels behind it. Um, it caused catastrophic bleeding. Then all the rest of the rats come out of the bushes, if you like, and were going round and, you know, on the bikes. To me... Again, can you can you swear on you? Don't know. See what you want. Shit bags, to be honest with you. Yeah. Um, how he got off the field, I'm still shocked. Um, because apparently the blood was just coming out of him. He got to Belleville Road and he collapsed on the left hand side. People were driving past people, and they only thought he was drunk because he looked like a man. Mm. Um, it took 35 minutes for an ambulance to come. Still don't know why it took that long. Um, while we were waiting, they come and got me which is only at the top of the road before I moved here. And when I got there, it was just chaos, absolute chaos. Everyone, was, No one knew what to do. Daniel's friends were distraught. They tied T-shirts around his leg you know, to try and stop the stem. But it was only when I spoke to the surgeon when he, he said basically Daniel was dead the moment he was stabbed. So there was nothing anyone could have done. Any, but you don't know that at the time, you see. So you're doing your best to try and save his life. Daniel knew he was dying. I had to watch the colour just drain out of his face. Um, all his lips were white. He felt cold and clammy. And he just said to me, Mum, I just want to go to sleep. I said, don't go to sleep. Next thing is I got pushed backwards by the police. And Daniel's father come. And uh, we don't get on. Uh, which doesn't bother me, to be honest with you. Um, but they, he ends up arguing with the police. So I said, get off him. It's his dad. I should have just kept my mouth shut, to be honest with you. You think you're doing good, don't you? Yeah, but you're reacting that, yeah. Yeah. Um, he come over and he went to hit me, but I moved my head. As I say, it's the first time he's ever missed me, but it's the first time I've ever got him. And man connected. Only for the two women screaming, saying it wasn't him, it, was, it wasn't me, it was him. Uh, well, four policemen tried to choke me out on the floor. 
So they then, because of that, wouldn't let me go in the ambulance. They allowed his father. Um, I'm to I'm in shock, standing here, felt humiliated. Um, and then I seen his bag on the floor. So he picks it up and he walks off. They'd gone in the ambulance, didn't even know where he was. So he goes towards my mum and family walking through Lee Park Estate. So I was in shock. It took nearly an hour to find out what hospital they'd taken him to because where we live in L25, I did assume he'd have gone to like Whiston, but they took him all the way to Aintree. So as well as that 35 minutes, he then had that big, you know, travelling up to Aintree Hospital. He went into cardiac arrest. They got him, his heart going again, but he'd lost too much blood. So he died at a quarter to 11. But when I got to the hospital, he died. So how many hours in bes- uh, uh, are they took? For us? He, the fight was about 10 to 9, roughly. It was when it, the, the football went into extra time. And then by the time everything happened, all the travelling and whatever they were doing with him, quarter to 11, he died. Just a few hours? Yeah. But y- uh, you could see it there. Yeah. Um, his veins had collapsed. He couldn't even get a needle in his vein at the time. And... You ju- it's you feel like you're helpless. Cause I gave birth to this to him to my son, my only son, and you know you can't you can see what's going on, mm. and there's nothing you can do. You feel like completely and utterly helpless if you like. But what uh, has made me more angry more than anything is the lack of remorse, um, you know the lack of respect. I ended up having all them twenty seven boys outside my house. What was the words he said? Yeah. We was there, but we didn't think he'd die. So, as far as I'm concerned, that's premeditated. They then bailed boy A and boy B 200 yards from my house and thought that that was okay. You so, know? They're both on bail? On top of me, yeah. So, and then, um, as I said, there's, when I asked them to explain that to me, because I worked within the legal system for a long, long time, I said, you'd have to go in front of a magistrate. I said, when you're asking for extra time, and they will ask you if they are to be bailed. Postcode differences between the victim families. And yeah. Them. So why, when we all live on the same estate, were they bailed? I think it was some kind of a thing that they were trying to see, you know, what, what we could find out. But they never, I mean, I give them all the information they needed. I asked for joint enterprise. They wouldn't give me it. What was, what, what was in the bag that you... I picked the you, bag you up. Oh, yeah, the next day, now don't forget, I didn't have to tell them. Yeah. Um, my mum come with the carrier bag. She just tied the carrier bag up. I said, oh, I need to tell you something. I said, I picked Daniel's bag up. I said, I bought it for him. I'd just seen it. I picked it up. So they were all right over it. But then Boy B's father was trying to say that I was trying to hide a knife. I'm not being funny. Billy, my son didn't need a knife to fight. He could fight anyone he needed to fight. And he... Even Boy B, who'd never had a fight in his life, up, c- going up against a boxer who was uh, physically stronger and physically bigger than him. You know, it's it's one of, it, you don't have to be like Einstein to work that one out to you, you know. No, no. I didn't have to tell the police. I chose to tell the police because I had nothing to hide. Daniel didn't need to fight with a, a knife. And the court proved that Daniel didn't have a knife. So as far as I'm concerned, my son fought with his fists. And he won the fight. He should have been allowed then to go home. There was no need for them to do what they did. It's like a power struggle, isn't it? It's also like that gang mentality. Yeah. I mean, the. I have got empathy for Boy B again up to a point. And how old was was, was Boy was B? He was a year older than Daniel. Daniel, Daniel was 16. He was 17 yeah. at the time. But it's kind of a... How can you put it? The, oh, oh, I've lost my train of thought there. Then say that again to me, Bill. I said, so he was a little bit older. Yeah, he was twelve months older. So by the time the trial come, um, when when it was all over, it was nearly his eighteenth birthday. So um, I asked Judge Aubrey. I wrote to Judge Aubrey and I said to him, "My my son's not here." I said to defend himself. I said, "I'm his mother." I said, no one will let me speak in the course. I said, because they don't want me to humiliate me, as he said, please, because of what they did to me. Mm. I said, because I will blow you. So I would have blown them all up. Yeah. I said, the way I was treated and everything else that went along with it. I said, so, you know, I said, 
you won't let me in. I was ass assaulted that night by the police as well as by my ex-husband. I said, my son is still not being represented fully as far as I'm concerned because I know more about what's gone on than anyone, but no one will let me speak in the course. Now, prior to Daniel's death, I had never heard of Boy Be before. Mm. I knew every other one. You'd never heard of No. No. And then we had three months after Daniel died, um, in Belvale, Daniel's friend Alex, who was with him that night, went to see his girlfriend. And one of the park boys, as they call themselves, they seen that him going into this house in Belvale. So next thing, 12 of them were outside the house, hammers, knives. What makes me laugh is they look like the Morris Stanton, and you know, and they're doing that, like, so look at me, I'm an alpha, mm. standing there and swinging like his hammer and everything else. They all cried like little girls when they went into jail, though. They're trying to intimidate Alex. And what made me laugh even more was the wall was three foot tall. If I wanted someone, Billy, I'd have been over the wall. No wall would have stopped me. And, like, they're all giving it loads, saying, you know, we killed your man. If you give evidence in court, we'll kill you too. Really? Do it one by one, then? It's who, who, who wants to get over the wall? Not one of them again. They were doing the same thing. That they thought they could intimidate me. And it didn't work out for them. I was launching bricks and everything at them. But their parents all gave them alibis. And no, I wouldn't have given Daniel an alibi if I'd have found out it was to do with a murder. Mm. I'd have made Daniel go and apologise. I've never been apologised to. No one's ever said to me, I am sorry for what we did to your son that night. Not one of them, not one of the parents or anything. So as far as I'm concerned, the parents are worse than the actual lads. Because to allow that, that's your fault. I would protect my son and I always have protected my son all of his life. But at the same time, no one has the right to take a life. I would have made sure that Daniel never got away with you no know, from doing that. But the carry on that I've had, the the insults, the abuse that I've taken off Boy B's father because he thinks his kid's a victim. No, he's not a victim. He was just a coward. And, it, you know, if you should have known what was going on. I knew about the bullying. I've always known about the bullying. I've knocked on parents' doors and everything over it. And I, why didn't he tell us that? And what makes me, everyone has got enough to say, and, I, and I've always noticed that, do you know, because, our oh, Daniel, because of our previous surname, yeah. people assume that we're like them. No, we're not. We're not, not even related to them, to be so honest that, with you. Because Daniel's, Middle name is G. No, his surname. His surname, so it's Daniel G. Jameson. Yeah. And people confuse it. Yeah. It was Daniel G. I was Mandy G while I was married to the father. The reason why I changed it is because I didn't want my son connected to it. Yeah. Because I kept, if the police say like he had been pulled up by the police to say, is this Danny G's kid? And I can't believe it's not. It's John G's kid. Has he been called out a few times? Has yeah. he been asked to be asked him? Yeah. yeah. And I didn't want that. I really didn't. I wanted my son to be himself standing as a man, you know, on his own without having anyone sort of thinking that he was connected to this, that or the other. Yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong, Daniel wasn't an angel. He was hard to work. I mean, we went through seven schools because of his ADHD. So you've got to understand as well, he's he's been like, from what you said, bullied from like an early age. Yeah. So he's suffering a lot of mental abuse. Yeah. It's 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 like what's going on on social media. You got yeah. social media bullying. Yeah. You know the Instagram, the Snapchat, the WhatsApps, the mm. all these groups that people yeah. set up and start like bullying people on. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of that going on. It does affect and, them. Yeah, and I, I I you know I'm involved in in something called Weapons Down, the gloves up, and you're involved in the knife crime campaign, and mm. you educate a lot of young kids. Yeah. You go into to schools and prisons and units and, and, and you share about what the impact and the consequences, mm -hmm. which, you know, I know what it's like to be stabbed. I know what mm -hmm. I've been on the receiving end of a knife. Yeah. You know, I've been lucky not to have lost my, my life. Mm -hmm. But no mother or father should have to, to bury their, yeah, their son or daughter. You know, and this is, this is for anyone out there who's, whose son, you know, may or may not be carrying a knife. You know, what do you feel the parents need to do? check your children on a friday on danny's place i put out a, a warning i just say know who your children are hanging around with 
who they're with, where they're going. But most importantly, check your children. No mother should have to bury their, their children, and you shouldn't. I mean, I never, everyone thinks, oh, it won't happen to me. It can happen to anyone, it really can't happen overnight, just it's like this. Yeah. I, I can imagine you never thought it'd happen to you. No. I share with one of the videos that I show in my talk, uh, Paul Williams, the music producer, did it for me. And it looks, it's Daniel's heartbeat. It's no sort of, and then it just flatlines. So what I say to the kids is, this is how quickly you can lose your life. And the feedback that I get, it's brilliant. What they say to me, because it's not a stranger standing there saying about Daniel this and Daniel, it's his actual mum. There's more of an impact with it. I mean, them kids were waving at my funeral cars. No, no remorse, no nothing at all. And to me, it's wrong. Where's the respect? All the respect's gone now. It, they say it takes a village to raise a child. Well, the village needs to start standing up for themselves, basically, because otherwise these are going to run amok. Otherwise, they're going to grow up and have babies, and they're going to put the same mentality into their own children as what they think and right now. Carry a knife, it's great, goes with your North Face, who are you, you know, and all this. And it's wrong. Yeah, there's a lot of, like, image orientation and yeah. county lines, and, yeah. you know, you mentioned, like, the drug dealing at an early age, and people you know, under peer pressure, yeah. being bullies to do things that they wouldn't normally do yeah. without the pressure that they're getting. Well, what boy A used to do was, he'd say, set them up for a day or whatever. They showed this video in the course. Um, now, what they didn't tell the course is that boy B was on drugs as well as the rest of them. And they had him in a shopping trolley. But it was sellotape. Now, to me, I'm not being funny. They wrapped him in sellotape. Hey, boy B? Yeah. Boy A was doing it, you know, wrapping him. Yeah. Mm, sellotape's not that hard to get out of, Bill. I'm like, oh, maybe it's me. I'm like tomboyish, I don't know, but... Oh, I think it is, you know. Uh, I th it is. I think um, I think if you, you, you're being wrapped, wrapped up because I've seen it happen a few times. Yeah, but it wasn't even tight. It was like hanging and everything. I... But the, they wouldn't let the court know that they were on drugs or anything like that, you know, just to prove the bullying. I would rather our Daniel had that done to him than his hair set on fire. So, so what do you think the solution is? What would you, like, see, in, in eyesight, what do you think the solution is to, to this? What I've said stuff? from day one, and I've stood by this, um, they removed all youth services. There's nothing for kids to do. They're building all kinds of houses everywhere, yeah. bringing more and more families in. Where's the community centres? Where, where's the incentive for them to do things? Where? There's nothing, Billy. There is absolutely nothing. And the youth centres that are, are open, barely just open. They've had their funding restricted that much and they, they can't have this many staff no more. So they run on skeleton staff. I feel so sorry for them. Kids need to be amused. They need yeah. to have something to do. To me, boxing is the best thing ever more. I mean, it gives you discipline. Yeah. It gives you focus and everything else. And, okay, you've got beef, as the kids call it. Get in the ring and knock ten kinds of shite out of each other instead yeah. of stabbing each other, isn't it? Boxing for me personally was um, was was a, a, my routine. Yeah, it was my routine. There was discipline, mm. like you just said, you know, and I, and I found like mutual respect amongst me peers in there, mm -hmm. and it was a positive pathway I was on. Yeah, you know, and then when. There was those breaks, Jordan, the holidays, and I found myself standing on street corners. Mm. You know, because there's a six-feet break, everyone has a little bit of a, a little break. That's when you, you're at your most vulnerable. Yeah. You know, because they say, don't they, bad company corrupts good character. And when you're a good kid and you're, you're having it with the wrong kind of people, mm. you know, you can get led astray if, you, if you're vulnerable in that area. Yeah. And that's... That's my that's my um, that's my story. It yeah, was. I agree with that. You know, I, I didn't have any. Um, so I was going to. I remember the community centres as a kid, the Venny and Speak. Yeah. I remember they uh, going there and enjoying it. We used to listen to "Come On Eileen" by Zex yeah, and Midnight you Runners. That? Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> you know, it was a place where like you just found loads of kids and you just playing in the mud and having a laugh. And there was no knife crime back when I was a kid. There was there was nothing like that. It's quite different today. It's quite scary. As it is. It is quite scary. Um, you know that you can lose your life 
it is. It's in the just, drop of a hat. Do, well, yeah. do you remember Marty Alice? The, the yeah. Her son, Alan Hooper, he was stabbed to death near, just on 30 years ago now. And Marty still feels the same as I do now. Each day when you wake up, it, it's all it's a horrible feeling because you know that he's not there. I mean, I've got PTSD now yeah. because of what's happened. I don't really sleep that much. and it, It's like you're living in Groundhog Day all the time. And apparently it does get a little bit easier further down the line. But I think... I, I, I couldn't imagine uh, what you're going through. I really, I really couldn't imagine the, the, the feelings that you'd be feeling because... I know, and the people out there who watch this, you've got children or siblings or, or even friends who've got kids. It's like, wow, you know, it's like you've lost your child. Do you know what I mean? It, 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 you know, it must be really, really, really heartbreaking. It is. You know, um, so how have you coped? Come on, come on Dan- how have you coped with it? Danny's place. Yeah. All my grief has gone into Danny's place. Don't get me wrong. I went over into Bellevale Park and I was painting boy boy a is a grass you know like sort of get me little loan back the police knocked and they said man have you been painting i said yeah do you want to see if it picture of it mm. and they burst out laughing because they didn't expect me to tell the truth i did do it i hold my hands up to it i put it out all over the internet and everything because he was a grass he did grass everyone up and everything else that went with it but it it's kind of like it was wrong me i'm not saying it was the right thing to do and don't you be doing that outside kids okay only Cuckoo grieving mothers are allowed to paint in the park. No, but it's understandable. I mean, you you you're not in the right place. No, you know, you're not in the right frame of mind. No, you're not. You know, you you know, you you're suffering a lot of trauma, and you're in shock. Yeah. And you're reacting. You're reacting. It's like uh, to be fair, if it was if it, if it was me in that position, I'd probably be either dead now or in prison doing life. Well, I moved because if I hadn't moved, I'd have ended up in jail. Yeah. Because it was getting that way. The anger is unbelievable. It's You just feel like, why? You know, and why would you, how could you do that? And you don't get it. And what I didn't get was the parents. Mm. You know, why? Has that, like, eased up? Like, the anger? Since the I've moved here, it's gone a lot better. Um, I mean, I used to go and sit outside boy, boy A's um, house early hours in the morning try, trying to goad someone to come out to me so I could get his mother or, you know, anything. Um, or I'd cause maids between them park boys saying, go and tell your mother where to live. No one ever come. I cause maids, you know, everywhere. You know, to try and get someone to come to me, but nothing. So you were just looking for a reaction from anyone? Yeah. No, he was involved so yeah. I could, like, do something because I felt like I had to do something. Now I don't so as much because Danny's place, I mean, if it wasn't for Danny's place, I'd probably either be in sections or in jail. Was you was you ever scared? No. Of any uh, any comebacks? No. Mum. You don't you go past it, Bill. You just you? went past all that. No, this is my kids was on the world. Yeah. Yeah. I get it. it it's like you t- you know, you can't build There's nothing can phase you know. No, no. Not at all. Not phases me in the way I look at if I can stand up to my ex husband, I can stand up to anyone. Yeah. Um, no, it's me, kid. Mm. I've always been that way, more so with Daniel because he had Asperger's and as well as the ADHD in his hair. Because I was terrified that, you know, if anyone hears his other ear, he'd be, go completely deaf. And I didn't want that for him. You wouldn't want your son to be completely deaf, would you? And like, don't get me, as I say, he was funny. You could have a laugh with him. My daughter's always felt like, oh, yeah, here we go with the blue eye again. Yeah, maybe he was the blue eye, but he needed more support from me. And it, it's caused a, it kind of caused a bit of a rift at one point because the girls were always bickering as well. But he'd do anything for anyone. Yeah. And he was kept inviting all his friends to come and stay in ours when his, their mums would kick them out. Oh, it's all right, me mum will sort you out. Don't worry. You know, bring them back there. Oh, it's okay, me mum will do this and that. Again, one thing I wanted him to do was tell his dad, but he told his dad to take no notice of me. I was being dramatic. He wasn't being bullied. He was, obviously. But so what was it like for you growing up? Was you a single mother while you... No, I've been married twice. I have my two daughters, my two eldest daughters. I was married for 13 years. Um, but we ended up like brother and sister because I was too young. And yeah. then I met... The twins, Dad, um, 
and we were, wasn't married that long to be honest with you it, it's just you know, the way you just don't get on it, it's kind of I loved him obviously I wouldn't have married him otherwise but yeah. at the same time I didn't agree with his life and I didn't condone his life I didn't like what he did and I think because I wasn't like his number one fan I think the thing with Dorm and they've got like that stigma is I call it easy like Sunday morning because mm. <laughs> No dorm with a dorman, but I just didn't want to be a dorman's wife, and I didn't like that lifestyle. It doesn't impress me. Yeah. What was it like for you growing up then? Um, my mum's like Julie Andrews. The hills are alive. She goes to church every day. Everything's godly. Um, she wouldn't. My mum always sees good in everyone. Yeah. If I come in, I see Billy Moore. She's called me this month. She go, well, how do you know Billy's not having a bad day? You so she'd know. look at someone else's, yeah. Yeah, I go, well, I'm your kid. Do, do you know what I mean? Like, that, don't get me wrong, she's very defensive over all of us. But we were brought up... But she had a different strict. approach with, um, yeah, so she'd like look at two sides of the coin. Yeah. But she, you know what, right, I do that now. I didn't before, you know, I kind of think, oh, what's going on for them? Mm. You know, it was all about me at one point. But now it's your, your baby. Yeah. And he's absolutely gorgeous as well, isn't Thank he? Yeah. He is, he looks like he's... A, is he like you? He's like his mum. He's like his mum. He's got just your not personality. Yeah. <laughs> That's what you want. He's got my shoulders. <laughs> we were like that with Daniel when he when he was little. He had like these calves. We do a boss's calves, and I do like <laughs> his dad. I mean, his dad was into all the bodybuilding and everything else that went with it. But I never really told the twins that much about the dad, what his past was, or anything. I don't really think that kids need to know that. Yeah. Um, the less the less they know in that area, you yeah, can't have it. got a benefit say, oh, them, yeah, is it? Your really? dad was this and your dad was that. Um, John's past was John's to tell, not for me to tell. Um, and I think he assumed that I had told him. I never, I never had, to be honest with you. Um, Daniel loved his dad, but he didn't want his dad to think that he was a coward because he was being bullied. Mm. That doesn't make you a coward if you're being bullied. I mean, if it was a, a one-on-one thing, you know, th- you look at it differently. But the fact and it, yeah, and this is important, yeah. you know. It's like, <coughs> and and I always like it, I always stress this, right, man? Mm. Right? It's like you know, when I was stabbed, my ego mm. was in front of me, you know, and my pride. Yeah, and someone had pulled a knife on me. Mm. And it was someone that we know, and it was a long time ago. And instead of just going, "All right, mate, you've got a blade there, I'm going to walk away," mm. it's like bringing a, 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 a like a knife to a gunfight. It's like yeah. bringing fists to a gunfight, and you know, you, I ended up getting stabbed, and I could have ended up, you know, you know, in, in another way. But when now on reflection, when I share that story with 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 kids, I say to them, "Do you know what I do now?" In hindsight, with what I know, is I'd run yeah. a mile. I wouldn't, I wouldn't react. I'd just go, okay, mate, shout, see you later, mm. and get off, live to fight another day. Yeah. Because I could have been just like your Daniel. Yeah. That that one stab, because yeah. I got stabbed in the chest. You know, I, I was lucky that I had a bit of padding. Yeah. Uh, and, and a top on, you know, that I didn't really penetrate any deeper mm. than I should have. But yeah, it could have been easily. Me on the floor, I know. you know, and my mum, my mum, burying me and grieving, and and I and I, I, I'd hate to like leave that behind and that memory. Yeah, you it's, know. It's, I mean, don't get me wrong. I go over there, and I, I, it's the only place where I feel comfortable crying, to be honest with you. And I roar at all, Daniel. Um, I said to him, "Yeah, I, always, I knew you'd always wanted to be famous, baby." I said, "But come on, this is like wow." But at first, I was angry with him. Why didn't you tell me? Because I know what, I actually know the answer anyway, because he knows how to drag them off that field. I've done it many a time, Billy. I don't give a shit. You say they don't care what they think I'd have killed him. I'd have launched him off that field. and Or if it was going off, I was there, I'd have probably ended up fighting there, because that's all I've done all his life, you see. And, and forces his battles. No, not forces battles for him. It was more. Or being in his corner, most yeah. of it, yeah. Because, as I said, I was just more bothered about his hearing and. and I know what those lads are like. I've been dealing with them for years and yeah. years. And like, to me, as I say, to me, they're all cowards anyway, especially Boye. He hasn't got a spine. 
the way I look at it. And it's not just kids though as well. I mean, my first day back at work, my manager, Mr. Daniel, I loved him. He was Romanian. And we had one of the Romanian vendors come in. And all I could hear is them talking. It's like quite an aggressive, isn't it? Like language and that. I didn't know. He had put a knife to his throat, no, to his own throat and said he was going to kill himself. But no one wanted to tell me because I, it was my first day back. Yeah. So I come out. I knew something wasn't right. And so I went, hello, love. I said, do you want to come for... I could see what was going on. I said, do you want to come for a ciggy outside? He went, sorry, lady, Mandy. I'm just trying to kill myself right now. I said, hang on a minute. So in the window was the maid of no, like a big massive poster. I said, do you know who this boy is? He went, no. I said, that's my son. He just dropped the knife. But then the police run in then and it was like all chaos going on. He wasn't going to hurt no one, Billy. He was a cry for help. Now, I can see the difference, you know, with that, but I had to deal with that my first day back at work. But at least he wasn't hurt. That's all that matters. He wasn't hurt. So what's the message that's that you carry to these kids today? I don't tell them, you know, take knives off streets or anything else. I basically say to them, if you carry a knife and you're stabbed, this is what's going to happen to your mum, to your family. Because what people don't get is, is Daniel's dead and I'll never get over that. But the aftermath of what's gone on, it's affected all, all of my family. Yeah. We're all deeply affected by it. It's it, it, it's wrong. I mean, I fell out with loads of my family over it. Because to me, you know, you haven't lost them, so you don't get where I'm coming from. They don't see why I'm angry over certain things. And to me, it's disrespect to my son. It's like my stepsister, her grandchildren, both of them were involved. And we only found that out later on. I lost my dad last September who was her dad mm. and I said to me mum I don't want them kids at the funeral I said because I'll and I would have I wouldn't have given a shit as I've ended up batting an ear the mother and everyone else that went with it they're supposed to be my family but they were involved Um, they knew Daniel was going to be stabbed that was the big plan you're going to stab Daniel what they didn't know and this isn't how uneducated they are there is no safe place to stab anyone mm. They just assumed, you know, just stab him and then it's done then. He won't die or not like that. Well, he did die. People think, okay, we'll stab him, stab somebody in the leg. Yeah. Or in the arm. I know. There's, not there's still veins there. Yeah. That's what they don't get. And that's what I'm saying to you. They're not educated. They're going around threatening, doing this, that and the other, like, who am I and all that. Well, know what you're talking about before you start doing it. You know, because at the end of the day, then these kids wouldn't be dead, would they? And what's the response? That I've been getting, it's yeah. been brilliant. The, the impact, you can see it in the kids' faces, you know, when I do it. Um, I do sort of say to them, how would your mum have reacted? Mm. And they just say to me, I don't know, I don't want her to react. Because they didn't want, a lot of mothers have said to me, I don't want to be you. Which I don't blame them for saying that to be honest with you of course yeah you know I wouldn't want to be in this position myself I wish I, I was back to normal I wish I had Daniel here but it, it's just I didn't ask for it if you like so some good has got to come from it and another I can't just can't don't want another mother to have to go through this it's horrendous I mean as I say when he first got buried I was putting umbrellas in the grave like a weirdo because he hated the rain I even went through a phase of tr wanting to dig him up because I didn't want to leave him over there. Hated being on his own. And it, you go through all different emotions and everything, but I tell you what, I feel sorry for anyone who ever crosses a grieving mother because th you just don't care no more. The way I was, I'd, I'd got, I mean, I was painting in the park. <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm going to get everyone. And like, it just felt so angry and it just wouldn't go. The anger was just, I can't explain it. It's like you're hormonal and menstrual, menstrual ho hormonal at the same time where you're like, uh, you know, you just want to hate everyone in front of you. And I just think, well, why don't you get it? And then I realise, well, they don't get it because they haven't lost their son. That's why. It, it, it's just one of them. But as I say, it, it has at one point virtually split my family up and he's now living with a dad, which I'm not happy about. Hmm. Um. I just think that she should be here with me. Um, when Daniel died, 
the first place that she ran to was up there. Um, I miss her. She, obviously, she's even though they're twins, she's my baby. But how old she now? She's twenty now. The twins, are, they've just had their twentieth birthday. They, they're going to be. Tw- I'm dreading the twenty first next year. I mean, it's. I feel like I hang round in the cemetery, but I'm obsessed. I've got it all flagged, and like I've got bench and all that now, and I like polishing it. I go mad if the birds poo on it because it just m- makes you demented. But it's somewhere that I can go and sit for a bit of sh- for your solace, a bit of peace. Yeah. And it, I know some people who go probably will pass me just and go, is that a crank again? I'll sit and I'll say to Daniel, this has happened, that's happened, or whatever, or I'll be angry, or I'll be sitting there crying. Because I can't, I don't do it in front of me kids, I don't want me kids to see me This is way. your, this is the your process, this is how you need to heal. Mm-hmm. You need to get it out somehow. I know. You know, and whether, you know, and whether that takes, you know, a year, two years, mm-hmm. ten years, you know, whatever know. Ever changes. But... This is so serious because you know other 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 kids out there need to know what their mother or father, you know, potentially know. could go through. It's horrendous. It absolutely. You know, horrendous. if they if they take someone else's life or their life is lost because they've been involved in in gang culture or knife crime, what do you think of um like the knife crime campaigns that have been going on in Liverpool and and, and you know nationally? <laughs> In Liverpool, um, I don't actually see an awful lot being done. Um, you, you, we have got like some people who are, are doing the bit, but I don't actually see what they're doing. I mean, I go into the schools, I go to alternative education, um, prisons, wherever, but I don't see there doesn't seem to be an awful lot in Liverpool who are doing that. I know um, there's a certain Alan Walsh does the boxing and that but but even then i mean i I think unless you have gone through what we be what i've been through that you wouldn't have the same type of sort of effect i know we can stand and talk about boxing and and everything else with it and i believe he has been stabbed himself in the past um but my son didn't deserve to be stabbed um my son regardless to his surname shouldn't have been judged that way or anything to do with that um no child deserves to die and kids should not be killing kids regardless kids should not kill kids i mean boy b got 11 years he's just been put in he's just been put into catty catty you been three years so out of 11, you're going to do half. So, you know, you're 11, you're five, five and a half years. And then he's got to do five and a half on licence. And on licence. So he's now going to go to an open prison. So my son's life basically has been worth three years. Yeah. Um, now, and he can come out of a weekend and everything else. That makes me angry as well. The justice system is not right. Yeah. I mean, even down to, you know, the prosecution, the defence and <laughs> things like that. I was sitting there and they went to him. The deceased families in the course. I said his name's Daniel. Call him by his name. Yeah. It's just like me calling you a dog, isn't it? Saying, I'm gone, dog. You know, you can go in the court now. I said, it's his name. Call him by his name. But I think it's with probation ev- and you know, and the police. Yeah. They are child they refer to, but I think they should change it. Because it, it upsets me every time they go, and the deceased, I go, his name's Daniel. Call him by his name. That's what his name is. Yeah. But it is. I mean, I, I know his physical body's gone and everything else. And people go, do you believe in the afterlife? And I don't believe in the afterlife. I think that it's something they... But I say, it's wrong. And I, I just miss him. What, what, what do you believe needs to change to make things... Youth services. The youth services. Do you believe that's the solution? I know that kids need to have something to do they need to be occupied and again the more houses that they're building they need to build a little community centre at the same time and they need to have a community that's invested in their kids I think to be to be, to be be fair I think people need to be more proactive yeah. in knife crime campaigns mm, they're not you know uh, it's not just a hashtag hashtag this hashtag that it's more you know it's more about you know uh, outreach Yep, a lot more interventions. Yep. And I think that's down to 
the council as well. The they count. need to, to the council that remove youth, the youth services. Yeah. So who's funding like or support or is it charities? The government. So charities are trying to raise money to do all this and you're just getting not getting anywhere with it because you're going into buildings new f- to become a, u- a community centre. Yeah. The roofs have gone on them. There's all kinds wrong with them because they can't afford to maintain them because all their funding's being pulled. Yeah, so you can raise all this money and then still, what are you going to do with it? Exactly. Where's it? What's you, it what are you, you going to put it into? Do things. At one point, we undo the old Netherly Comp School. Yeah. And it's got like the old gym, but it just looks like a roof now, doesn't it? Mm. The council was selling that for a quarter of a million pounds. Where am I getting a quarter of a million pounds from, Bill? They said, oh, you can have that. Oh, great, thanks. But how am I going to pay for it when we haven't got no money? I haven't got a quarter of a million pounds. Mm. I said, you know, this is about kids. We're trying to do good. No, it just felt like they were trying to you know, prevent us from doing good. Because what we wanted to offer was classes for parents as well, support for parents. Because kids now, a lot of them have got behavioural problems. A lot of them have got... Yeah, the kids these days are being labelled with a lot of... Yeah. You know, labels, so yeah. to speak. You know, PTSD, ADHD, yeah, ASD, you know, ADD, bipolar. I know the there's, whole thing. There's, there's a lot. You know, like when we were kids, we were just around a bend. Yeah. Oh, I was around a bend, and that's yeah. it. And you just like never thought not. Or a schizo. It. That yeah. was a big shout when Crank. I was a kid. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was more of a schizo. You know, sometimes I felt like if you called me a schizo, I felt comfortable with that because it made me. Yeah. It was a coping mechanism. Yeah. If I'm a schizo, then obviously you know you're in fear of. What my reaction will be, so that meant the feed, yeah. Right, fucking, yeah, yeah, yeah for you, scared, so <laughs> yeah, um, it's there's a there's a there's a there's a lot that needs changing, and I feel like see, I've I'm, I like I, I sort of take you know care leavers and, and kids, mm. you know, through boxing, yeah, academies and regimes and routines, mm. but is that enough? No. You know, is that enough? It's we like need consistency. It's, you know, it's, it's it's for me. It's like it's more like like education, awareness, yeah. employment. Yeah. Right, because if you if you're not employed and, and you're, you're a youngster, you're on the streets. You know, you're hanging around with girls and lads, and there's loads of egos and hormones and testosterone getting flew about. We all need to instead of all being in competition with each other. Look at me or look at this. Do you yeah. feel that's what? It, do you feel that's what it's like? It's in competition. I think it's a male ego competition. Yeah. yeah. Completely and utterly, yeah. It's all about who's the one. I'm the one that's on top. Who cares? Yeah. As long as we're doing good, that's all that matters. It does not matter. Collectively, as a as a community, mm-hmm. we're all supporting. Yeah. You know the but, right. But the thing with that, the consist kids need consistency. Yeah. So instead of saying, "Oh yeah, you can go once a week," I wanted to open something which was open on seven days, like yeah. a place where, where they felt safe. But it was not just for kids; it was for the parents as well. So if the parents are getting the support, they're then able to support yeah. the kids more, aren't they? Yeah. Because it is difficult to cope with the kids. With did, the did, you ever, did you ever ask like, the councils why these community or youth centres were getting closed down? They said that the government pulled the money. So did the government get challenged over that by yeah. anyone? Everyone has challenged. This has been going on for a long, long time now yeah. over the youth services. But if you, if you know yourself, if you're occupied, you're fine. Yeah. If your kids are occupied, they've got something to do. They're no bother. They're not fighting. Because most kids these days now are, 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 you know, are, are locked in bedrooms, isolating. I don't think COVID's uh, helped with that no. as well. They need more fresh air. They need more exercise. Xboxes and Playstations yeah. are, are like a, a, a bla- it's a blame for a lot of like the lack of social interaction with people. Makes them aggressive as well. I believe in early intervention too. I think that we should get kids from an early age now and um, you know, sort of educate them about yeah. county lines, knife crime, gun crime, everything. And it, instead of like wrapping them in cotton wool, yeah. it's kind of like the chairman of Danny's place, Charles, yeah. when we went to see um, the head of probation, he said, I just worry, he said, no, in case Mandy says the wrong thing because I've got no tact. Yeah. Should you leave her alone? You, Charlie? Yeah. You going to the gym still, Charlie Jenkins? <laughs> no, you're our mate. Panicked. And so she went, no, you leave her the way she is. Yeah. She's real. So I think instead of raining me in, you should allow me to show kids, look, this is what's going to happen. I think kids need to see the damage, the truth. 
instead of multicoddling them as per usual and wrapping them in cotton wool because you know you're not allowed to raise your voice in front of a child now or anything else when we were growing up Billy. well we got battered yeah. you know, clouted everywhere yeah. you it's know one of them my dad was in charge and what my dad said went and that was the way it is but i had respect for him exactly yeah there's no respect is there no none whatsoever you said that earlier on didn't you you know you know it's like you respect your elders you know you you're getting spoken to you know like shit by kids yeah and it's not nice and what i don't like is now around belleville they're intimidating <laughs> all the old people do you know if i ever saw that i mean i'd stop the car and get out and get them myself do you know what i mean you can't be doing stuff like that it's wrong or they throw fireworks at them. I know, like, kids are kids at the end of the day. But no one checks them. Yeah. Why aren't the parents need to start getting involved in their kids' lives? They think once they go to school, oh, yeah, I'll just leave them. Let them get on with it now. They're in school. They can look after themselves. No, they can't. They still need your support. Again, I'm not parents of the year. I will never, ever pretend that I am parents of the year. Yeah. You know, I've made many mistakes. But you learn by your mistakes. That's how we grow as people, isn't it? Which is why, I mean, we're doing an, an event on the 25th of September and it is for National Remembrance Day of all victims and their families of youth violence. And it's in the cathedral. And I would like to invite all victim families in the Liverpool area to come at half six to the Anglican Cathedral. And we've got all acts on and it, it's just going to be a lovely two hours and um, Bellevale Morrisons have given us loads of food as well. They're, everyone's been brilliant over it. But the mayor, Joanne Anderson, she's backed me 100% with this. And at the same time as where the Knife Angel is now in Chelmsford, we're going to light our city up purple. And as you know, purple's for the red and the blues, and you know, so no one gets like sensitive over, like if you put a red light up or a blue light up. I just think that's pathetic, you know. <laughs> Sorry, but it is. Um... We're doing it purple, but the whole place is going to go, going to go up purple to acknowledge what our kids have been through. And I'm made up with that, you know. Yeah. Because my son deserves to be remembered. You know, I'm proud to be his mum. I'm, I'm proud that I can stand and talk about him. I'm proud that he used his fist that night. You know, he wasn't a coward. And he doesn't carry on the way they were carrying on, you know, one of the little packs yeah. of animals the way they are. But it, again, the parents need to stand up to them. And Don't that's it. That's the that's the um, that's a big part of the solution. And that the problem is, yeah, single parents or not, I was a single parent. Yeah. I mean, if I can do it with four kids, two of them with ADHD, um, you know, at the end of the day, it was not an easy job, and it isn't. And I'm not saying that it is. I mean, it's been plenty of times I felt like running away. But they're your kids at the end of the day. You want what's best for your kids, don't yeah. you? I mean, it, some parents have come to me and said to me, how can you stand there and talk about your son? Well, why shouldn't I talk about him? You know, I think, what the fuck is wrong with you? you know, I said, listen, you know, unless you walked a mile in my shoes, I said, you can judge me as much as you want. I couldn't give a shit. Mm. I said, what I am doing helps me. I'm I'm help doing this to help me, but I'm also doing it so that another mo mother doesn't have to go through this. It's horrible, Billy. You know, you standing over his grave, even when I polished it because I'm neurotic over it. You know your kids there, and it, it's horrible. You know, you just sometimes feel like smashing it all up mm -hmm. and digging them, bringing them. But I haven't got a garden either in this one, so I can't. It's it is. It's so if you you, you you know if there's a load of different kind of feelings going on, there's any emotions. Yeah. You know, you're trying to process it at the same time. Mm -hmm. So we're coming to the end now of our podcast, but what I always say, man, he writes at the end of a podcast is, uh, any pales of wisdom, and what would you say to a younger, you know, I don't know, uh, you know, to anyone out there who's... who's carrying a knife. Carrying a knife. Don't be a coward. You be you, and do not have other people trying to mess with your brain or anything else stand up for yourself and be yourself at the end of the day you've only got one life yeah that's it and if you're allowing other people to manipulate your life to the way they want it to run you know mm -hmm. what's the point yeah and where can we find you on 
Facebook. You can find me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. If anyone needs, I will also support any family who are going through what I've been through as well. Yeah. Um, you know, and we've also got Sam National, which is supposed against murder and manslaughter. Anyone that feels that they're not getting any help, please let me know and I'll help you. Mm, yeah. Well, I'll put all all your uh, your ID in the in the description, so yeah. they can catch straight to your links in that. Yeah, but I mean, I'm with that, Mandy. I really, really, really thank you for coming on. And thank you, Billy, as well. It's a pleasure. Thanks.